Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming along today to, to listen to our webinar. My name's Nathan Barwell. I'm one of the category managers here at the Seaward Group. Uh, I specifically look after our manufacturing and our tool hire uh, test equipment ranges. So today we're going to be talking all about electrical safety testing within the tool hire industry. So the aim of today's presentation really is to give you an overview uh, about the testing, why we perform the tests, what the tests are, and some of the kind of maintenance procedures you, you may need to follow to ensure your equipment is, is up and running and, and safe. So without pause, let's have a quick look at today's agenda. So firstly, we'll talk about the risks and why we should be testing. We'll introduce you to the Higher Association of Europe's Code of Practice for in-service testing. We'll briefly introduce you to creating safe working environments. It's all about ensuring your work, work area is safe uh, and, and therefore your, your operators aren't going to potentially put themselves in hazard's way. We'll talk about the types of equipment you should be testing, uh, how to identify the equipment in order to help you create the tests that you need to perform on that particular piece of kit. Then we'll go into the tests themselves. We'll talk about how they're performed. We've got some animations to show you exactly what's happening during the test. We'll discuss what the minimum requirement is for the testing on different types of equipment. We'll talk about how often you should be testing uh, your, all of your equipment and then we'll talk about the verification of your test equipment so again ensuring that your equipment is, is working as expected um, in between your regular scheduled calibration periods okay so firstly let's have a discussion about why we test equipment well obviously the the main reason we test the equipment is to make sure it's electrically safe uh, and the reason we do that is, is ultimately because the industry in which we are currently working poses one of the highest risks to equipment becoming unsafe electrically uh, and there's a number of factors involved in that, that that could contribute to making the equipment unsafe. Firstly for us um, from a training point of view we have no visibility of the equipment whilst it's on hire. We don't know if it's being used safely, we don't know if it's being used correctly, we don't know if the person using it has any kind of malicious intent for example and we also have no understanding of the user so even, even if we did know the person that's coming to collect the equipment or the person signing for it, we don't know ultimately who's going to be using it at the end of the day. So we don't understand whether they know how to use the equipment safely, uh, whether they want to use the equipment safely. Obviously, with the equipment not being their own, there is the potential that they feel no ownership towards that product. So, you know, dropping it, not caring for it as it should be, uh, could, could come quite highly in this environment. And the other thing that we need to consider is the actual environment in which the uh, the equipment's being used. Now, more often than not, I think it's fair to say that this kind of equipment that we're renting out is being used in kind of construction type environments. And with that comes dust, damp, uh, yeah, lack of lack of general potential care by the uh, by the users. It, it could contribute to becoming unsafe more frequently than maybe in a in a kind of in, internal DIY type uh, environment. So all of those factors combined, if we, if we took them all individually and, and looked at the risks involved, there is a high potential there for, for misuse or potential damage to occur accidentally. Obviously, with that come the risks, and those risks are twofold. Number one, a fire from a, a damaged equipment coming into contact with something combustible uh, could, could potentially start a fire, or risk of an electric shock to, to an operator or, or somebody else around the uh, the environment. So the other reason we test is obviously to ensure that, that we are safe and that we are covering our, our legal requirements in terms of any kind of legislation out there. Now, for us in, in the hire industry, there are really four key legislations that, that could have an impact on us and, and reasons why we, we might want to test. So firstly, Pretty broad strokes, the Health and Safety at Work Act, that makes a statement that every employer holds a duty of care to ensure the safety of all persons using their premises. So again, your customer renting the equipment, they have a duty of care to ensure that um, any persons on their premises are safe. And part of that would include the, the tools at which they use. The Management of Health and Safety at Work regulations makes a very similar statement. Every employer shall make suitable and sufficient assessment of a, the risk to the health and safety of his employees, and B, the risk to the health and safety of persons in connection with the conduct by him of his undertaking. So effectively, anyone that works for him and anyone that has any interaction with, with his business. 
Then we come into the provision and use of work equipment regulations. Uh, and this one really is twofold, both for you as the employer and for your customers. Every employer shall ensure that work equipment is suitable for the purpose for which it's used or provided. So that would also include kind of making sure the equipment is maintained properly, is safe for use, and ultimately is the correct tool for the, for the job. Where it gets a little bit more um, honed in on today's webinar in terms of electrical safety is the electricity at work regulations. And they make three statements that are, are fairly important. All electrical systems and equipment shall be maintained so as to prevent, so far as is reasonably practicable, any danger. Testing is to be carried out by a competent person and test results must be retained so as to maintain, trace, to maintain traceability. So again, for us, we need to make sure our equipment is safe. We need to maintain it as far as we can to ensure it's safe. Uh, and from a training point of view, testing should be carried out by, by a competent person. So all of those things combined um, lead to ultimately our, our destination of the uh, Higher Association of Europe's Code of Practice, the HAE EST 2020, 2012 guide. So this document was written by the HAE Technical Committee. So you would have proud to be part of, of that committee, ensuring the standards of, of work are safe. But we got together as a group and decided to finally write a code of practice to ensure that all of higher companies uh, are following a, a set of guidance to ensure their products are safe. So this code of practice was released in, in early 2013. I, I would certainly advise if you haven't got a copy to, to make contact with the HAE uh, and, and request a copy. It's worth having on site. Um, it, it, it's got full of good kind of reference material for you. Discusses all of the kind of pass and fail limits that I'll go through as we, we go through the presentation. So lots of what we talk about today on the presentation are covered um, within, this, uh, within this guidance document. So before we move on to talk about testing in general, the first thing we need to consider is, is our own operators. We're going to talk about how we keep our customers safe, but ultimately, firstly, we need to ensure our own staff, our own employees are safe. So one of the things we need to do is look at how we can protect against electric shock within the, uh, the workshop environment. Now, there's two main things we can do to reduce uh, severity of an electric shock or negate the 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 potential for an electric shock the first thing is if we reduce the potential for current to flow through the body so if we limit the path that current can flow through the body then we we instantly limit the uh the safety element of of the the shock hazard so we do that by simply insulating the test area so those of you that probably have already got an established um environment will know there's things like rubber matting we can use but essentially what we're trying to do is remove any ground path through the operator if current can't flow down down to ground then the shock hazard is removed the other thing we can do is reduce the duration of the exposure so if we have methods of automatic disconnection then great so things such as rcd devices um, or rcbo's that will automatically disconnect the supply uh, in the event of a fault obviously those things will, will need regular maintenance and checks um, but those are the two key aspects that we need to think about. How can we reduce the potential for current flow through our operators if the worst was to happen? But also, how can we um, inhibit the duration um, by means of automatic disconnection? So what we're looking to do ultimately is create a, a safe working environment. Now, we do have a separate webinar that discusses this in, in a lot more detail. But I'm going to quickly talk through the major things that we can do to create a safe working environment. Now, there is a European standard, EN50191, which talks all about creating uh, safe working environments. Ultimately, what we're looking for are the following four kind of things. An insulated test area, so we're protecting our operators doing the testing. Prohibition zones. The prohibition zones are designed to keep the untrained away from contact with the, uh, the equipment under test. Safe con disconnection of supply, as we spoke about, and then things such as warnings or information signs to alert everyone to what the uh, the area was used for. So let's talk quickly about the workstation itself. Now, in an ideal world, you'd have a test bench. It would be fully insulated. Um, wood, obviously, being a great insulator, would be would be perfect in this instance. If you do have a metal frame bench, make sure the top of it is insulated. So anything that's coming into contact with the top of the bench 
is uh, in contact with a uh, an insulated top. Uh, there should be no conductive fixings visible on the top. Good housekeeping would suggest that at the time of the test, only the item on the on the bench is only the item that we're supposed to be testing, and you haven't got a uh, kind of raft of tools kicking around. Potentially, those metal tools could come into contact with the device. If there was a fault, potentially those tools could become live. And we don't want to create a situation where someone goes to pick up uh, a wrench or a screwdriver and potentially come into contact with the metal part of that tool. And fortuitously, that's in contact with something that is uh, outputting live voltage. So always keep the bench kind of nice and neat. Make sure the only thing on the bench at the time of testing is anything you need for that particular test. Keep your test bench within the test area so that it's not easy for people to reach over and touch and get hold of the equipment whilst it's it's underway. And you should never test while stood on a metal, concrete or ceramic surface. So our advice is always make sure you install suitably rated rubber matting uh, onto the floor. In terms of exclusion zones, it's ideal to create some kind of barrier to stop uh, anyone that doesn't understand what's going on in the area from having access to the area. Now it can be as simple as, as chain links, uh, it could be a physical kind of wall, um, anything that stops anyone coming into contact with it. Now if you are determining things like posts and barriers, there is a set distance that those barriers should be away from the item under test. Um, we have some guidance on that. If anyone wants uh, a guide to creating safe working areas, let me know in the in the comments uh, or the chat function. We'll be happy to send that over to you. Items such as um, signal beacons alert people as to when the area is safe or unsafe. Now, all of the, the Claire, as you may know them, or the Seaward um, test equipment in the hire industry has the ability to connect to a signal light. Now, that signal light indicates exactly when the area is potentially live. Uh, and therefore hazardous. So if you don't want people to enter the area, for example, when testing is underway, the, the output from the tester can light up a uh, red light. People know instantly that the area is unsafe. We should always make sure we've got uh, methods to disconnect the uh, electrical supply in the event that something was to go wrong. Now there's two key elements we'd, we'd recommend here. The first one being what we call emergency stops or e-stops. Uh, they're very simple, large push buttons that in the event that something goes wrong, you can press the button and, uh, and cut the power. Now, I'd always recommend having two of these as a minimum, one inside the area. So the person doing the testing, if they spot something wrong, they can hit the button and powers off. The second one being outside the area. If the worst was to happen and, and someone was receiving an electric shock that was performing the testing, what we don't want to be able to do is get in there and, and come into contact with them before the power's off. So having an emergency stop outside of the button means that we can press that and then enter the area knowing safely that the area has been disconnected. And also, as we said before, you should fit the area with, uh, with some RCD protection. And the final kind of key thing is just some signs. So we'd certainly recommend that we put signage around the area again. For those untrained visitors, um, people that may just be wandering through the workshop environment, it's always worth ensuring that people can visibly see exactly what that area is for and ultimately exactly that that area is not for them. So you can see things like danger high voltage test area, um, danger do not enter when red light is on. All of these things will, will help to guide people that that area is, is, is off limits. Okay, so before we talk about the types of equipment, let's have a look at the scope of the, the code of practice. So the Higher Association of Code of Practice applies to equipment supplied at voltages up to and including 1000 volts AC or 1500 volts DC, and that includes single or multi-phase equipment supplied at 400 volts, 230 volts or 110 volts. The guidance document applies to equipment that has been either hired for a commercial basis and after performing a repair. So if you do either of those two within the hire industry, uh, the code of practice applies. So any equipment that you're hiring out, but also any equipment after you've, um, after you've repaired it. At that point, testing is required. So there are a number of types of equipment we talk about. Now, why do these become important? Why isn't equipment just equipment? Well, the type of equipment may determine 
the type of test we need to perform, but also the um, the pass limits. So you'll see we have a few types of equipment, portable, handheld, movable, stationary, fixed equipment and, uh, and information technology equipment, along with things like leads uh, and extensions. Now, generally, we, we tend to find that fixed and information technology equipment are probably the lesser of the, uh, the types of equipment we would hire out because by very definition, these are things that will, will go out and come back uh, fairly regularly. So things like portable, handheld, movable and, and stationary are really where we'll focus our time today. So what's the definition of each? Well, a portable piece of equipment is an appliance of less than 18 kilograms and is intended to be moved whilst in operation or an appliance that can be easily moved while in operation uh, from one place to another. So things like you know, uh, vacuums, that kind of thing. Uh, we then talk about handheld equipment. So again, handheld equipment is fairly self-explanatory. So this is anything that can be moved around nice and simply and is intended to be held uh, in the hand during normal use. So you'll see examples, you know, drills, grinders, that kind of thing would always be classed as, as handheld. We then have movable equipment. So movable equipment is up to 18 kilograms and not fixed. Um, and something that can either be easily transferred via means of handles or things that have maybe casters or wheels on them that allow you to move them move them around. Uh, the final one is, is something that's stationary equipment. Um, again, this is generally designed to be sat in one place and, and not really move. So generally it's heavier, over 18 kilograms, not provided with things like carrying handles. So it's designed to be placed in one spot and used in that in that one spot. So let's briefly move on to talk about the classifications of equipment. So we now know we're dealing with things at uh, three phase, single phase, uh, 110, 240, uh, 415 volts. Um, but then there's different types of equipment or we call them classes. Um, most of you will know this is earthed or non-earthed but typically we call them class one or, or class two. There are some other classes for zero to three, but for most intents and purposes, we're generally dealing with class one and two uh, in, in this industry. So let me give you the definition of a class one equipment. Equipment in which protection against electric shock does not rely on basic insulation only, but which includes the means for connection of exposed conductive parts to a protective conductor in the fixed wiring of the building installation. All class one equipment will therefore have three core cable, live, neutral and earth. So, so what does that mean in, in real terms? Well, ultimately, the product relies on an earth cable uh, for protection against electric shock. We have basic insulation, which you'll see in the diagrams is the, the insulation on the cable, potentially the insulation on the product itself. But there will be exposed metal parts. Now, those metal parts potentially could cause a hazard in the event that they were to become live. So if, if there was a short or something within the, um, the product has gone wrong, the live cable is in contact with the external casing, that casing could become live. Now, if we were to touch that, we would potentially receive an electric shock. The earth cable is designed to have a very good low resistance path to earth, and that acts as a simple path to keep the current away from, from you and I and giving us a, uh, a hazardous shock. So... If you ever open the plug up and you see three core cable, there's a good indicator and it is just an indicator that the product is, uh, is a class one device. Class two equipment. Well, class two equipment, or as it's also sometimes known, double insulated, doesn't rely on an earth for electrical safety. So to give you the definition, equipment in which protection against electric shock does not rely on basic insulation only but in which additional safety precautions such as supplementary insulation are provided. There is no provision for the connection of exposed metalwork of the equipment to be connected to a protective conductor, and there are no reliance upon precautions to be taken in the fixed wiring of the insulation. So it, in, in essence, what we're saying is there's no reliance on a, an earth cable to provide any safety in a, in a class two or double insulated product. But as its name kind of refers, Double insulation means there are two layers or more of, of insulation between the uh, exposed parts and anything that could potentially cause a hazard. So generally class two equipment, if you open the plug up, 
will only be fitted with two core cable, live and neutral. It is rare, but it can be found that some appliances may have a, an earth cable in there. Now that earth cable on a double insulated product will not be for any safety purpose. And it's usually meant for any kind of screening. Typically you may find it in a, a monitor. It's what's known as a functional earth. Um, and what its function is, is to channel noise. So in order that we get a nice crisp display, it may channel any noise away down the earth cable, but it's not for, for any safety equipment. So, okay, we've talked about opening the plugs up and looking at how many cables are, are within the, uh, the plug itself, but that's not necessarily the best way of, of telling whether the thing is a class one or two device, purely because we don't know whether someone's replaced the cable while it's been out on hire. So our best bet is to look for the symbol. So any product that is class two will always be denoted with a double insulated symbol. And you'll see it here just down in the bottom right hand corner. It's basically a box within a box. So that should be our first port of call whenever we're trying to define what type of equipment are we dealing with. We should have a look for this, this symbol. Now, there is a symbol for grounding or earthing, but there isn't a requirement for that to be on the, the rating plate of the equipment. However, if it is a class two, there is a requirement for the double insulated sign. So the best advice we can give is always go to the rating plate. If it has this sign on, which are dealing with a class two, if it doesn't, we should assume it's a class one uh, and test it accordingly. Okay, so we've now determined that we understand the type of products we're gonna be testing. We know whether we're dealing with a double insulated or a class one product. Let's start to talk about the, um, the tests themselves. Now, ultimately, all of the electrical safety tests we're going to talk about today have the aim of proving one of two things. That number one, if we have earth, an earth cable, where it is fitted, we need to make sure it's adequate. We need to make sure it's doing its function. It's got a good low resistance. And the other tests that we talk about today will have um, one purpose, and that's to prove the insulation is good. So any insulation, and when I talk about insulation, effectively what I mean is any barrier within the product designed to keep you and I safe from an electric shock is, is determined as, as insulation. So those are the electrical safety tests. There are some other tests that we may perform, which are what we call functional testing. And those functional tests aim to prove that the unit operates as we expected. So, you know, things like speed or heat settings. This is really just making sure that the equipment that we're putting out on loan is actually doing what it's designed to do and it's doing it correctly. Just as a brief note, um, the manufacturer of any equipment should maintain the ultimate authority on his, his equipment and how it should be tested. So if you are doing any tests and you're maybe not receiving the results that we talk about in today's uh, guidance, we'd always recommend consulting the manufacturer and asking them for uh, guidance on exactly how the product should be tested. So let's talk about the, the first test that we should perform before we even consider putting the unit into a, a test equipment and, uh, and performing electrical safety tests. And that's the formal visual inspection. Now, it's very important to note that the inspection phase of the test is probably the most important part. You can see up here that 80% of electrical faults are generally discovered when doing the, uh, the visual inspection. So it is important that we do the visual inspections, it's important that we note the visual inspections, um, and ensure that they are done correctly. Now, in essence, we're looking at three main areas on the product for um, visual inspection. We generally always start at the end that we want to plug in, the plug itself. So in that case, we're looking for things such as cracked cases, any bent pins, uh, incorrectly rated fuses, if you do have um, 240 volt equipment, uh, incorrectly connected wires within the plug, loose connections, loose cable clamps. Um, other things to be aware of are things like um, sheathed earth connections. So it, it's sometimes common that you'll see that the uh, manufacturer has actually sheathed the earth. If you do see that, that should be a failure. Um, it's, it's known that the grip needs to connect to the, uh, the metal shaft on the earth pin. If you have a plastic sheathing over it, quite often that grip is sitting on the plastic and therefore we've interrupted the supply of um, connectivity between the two and the earth is effectively useless um, because it's now insulated. So if we're happy with that the plug's good, we can then move on to the mains lead. 
Again, we're looking for similar sort of damage to it, uh, whether that's fraying, brittle insulation. Uh, be careful kind of where it's kinked and coiled. By the time you un uncoil it, that, that potentially causes issues. Always be wary of things like um, tape joints. Uh, I'd always recommend taping the, taking off the tape, seeing exactly what's going on underneath. Uh, and if you need to, again, again, fail it. And also make sure it's got the correct cross-sectional area for the for the appliance that we're, we're performing the test on. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail when we look at the, um, the earth bond testing. And then once we're happy that the lead's satisfactory, we can move on to the appliance itself. So again, we're looking for kind of any signs of damage, drops, whether it's been cracked, uh, any signs of moisture being kind of present within the device. Um, you know, any anything that doesn't look right, whether the, the switch has fallen off and someone's put a new one on, is it the right one? Does it do the job effectively? All of those kind of things. If it doesn't look right on the visual inspection, my advice would always be to fail it and seek advice from maybe someone else uh, to get a second opinion. But assuming the visual inspection is good, we can move on to, to start talking about creating uh, the correct test for the, the product. Now, the first thing I would always do is come to have a look at the rating plate. The rating plate gives us a lot of useful information that helps us to determine exactly the type of test that we need to, uh, to perform. So there are a few uh, things on here I'll point out to you. You can see the operating voltage. Again, that tells us exactly what operating voltage the product should run at, uh, which will ultimately tell us if we've got the right plug on the end. Uh, we can th see things like the uh, rated current or wattage, and that will help us a little bit later when we talk about functional tests. You'll also be looking for things like the double insulated symbol. Uh, but there's also other information on there, like things like serial numbers that you might want to record, because that will give us a unique reference to, to help keep our maintenance logs uh, on the equipment that we're testing. So once we've got through to this stage, uh, we now know what equipment we've, we're testing. We should understand whether it's class one or class two. That will help us now to determine exactly what tests we're gonna be performing. So what we're gonna do at this stage is we're gonna talk you through all of the potential tests that you may want to do on, on a product. And then we'll talk about exactly which ones are, are viable for which particular type of equipment. So the first test we're gonna talk about is the earth bond or, or earth continuity as you, you may know it. The earth bond test is only performed on class one equipment, so equipment that has an earth. Um, because the test is purely based on that earth circuit, it's only performed on, on class one equipment. So the test is to ensure that the connection between the earth pin and the mains plug of the appliance and the metal casing of the appliance is satisfactory and sufficiently low resistance. A selectable test current is applied between the earth pin of the main supply plug and the earth bond test clip. Now this earth bond test current can be one of two ways. We can either do what we call a soft test, which is a low current test, but in order to do this test correctly, we need to flex the cable. The reason being is that the low current test won't potentially highlight any breaks or, or um, damage to the cable. Um, so we flex the cable and if there is any damage, that that, that flexing will show up the, uh, the potential damage. The other option is what we call a hard test, which is 1.5 times the fuse rating up to a maximum of 25 amps and we perform this on each point between 5 and 20 seconds. The pass limit for a good test is, is what we call 0.1 plus R. Now 0.1 is always in there as a constant and the R value will vary depending on the type of equipment you're testing and it will vary upon two factors. The cross-sectional area or how thick the cable conductors are internally and how long the, uh, the cable is. Now we'll have a quick look at this table. Now this table tells us uh, some really relevant information for working out the, the pass fail threshold for the, uh, the potential equipment that we're testing. So you'll see the left hand column is the conductor cross sectional area in uh, millimeters squared. Now typically you'll find this actually on the cable itself. As you inspect the visual, to do the visual inspection for the cable, you'll feel or see the printed uh, information Part of that information will include the cross-sectional area of the cable. Now, for each cross-sectional area, there is a conductor resistance per meter, and that's highlighted in column two. 
So as a good example, for every meter of 1.5 millimeter squared cable, we will have a resistance of 0.0133 uh, ohms. The other thing that's important for is the current carrying cap capability of that cable. So for example, if we had a product that had a uh, 30 amp potential rating, there would be no point fitting that with 0.75 mil cable because it's the incorrect cable for that particular uh, appliance. So what does this all mean? Well, to determine our earth bond, we simply come back to our 0.1 plus R value. Now you can see in the little example here, we have a cable of three meters. It's got a cross-sectional area from inspection of one millimeter squared. So to work out the total resistance and therefore the pass limit, we do three times for our three meters times the cross-sectional area, which in this case for one millimeter squared is 0.0195. So we multiply those two values together. That gives us a value of 0.0585. So that's our resistance of the cable. We can then add in our constant, which is this 0.1 value, and that will give us a value of 0.1585. So providing when we perform the test, the value is below that particular resistance, everything will be good and the test will pass. So at this stage, I'm just gonna flip over to a quick animation. This animation will detail exactly what happens during the test, so you get a feel for what's happening with the current flow. The earth continuity test is used to verify that there is a good electrical connection between any exposed metal parts and the protective earth pin in the mains plug of a class one appliance. As we can see, the appliance is plugged into the pat and the test probe is connected to exposed metal parts. Current is then passed from the pat tester through the protective earth conductor of the mains cord to the enclosure. It then flows back to the pad tester via the protective earth conductor. The pad will then display the resistance of the protective earth path. The second test we're going to talk about today is our flash test or high pot test. Um, it's essentially what's known as an electric withstand test. Now you'll see instantly the first thing that I'm going to highlight are the high voltages, 1250, 2500 volts AC. So it is quite a high voltage um, test that, that is performed here. And ultimately, this test is the main reason why we talk about having safe working environments. There is a hazard um, in terms of performing this test. It could produce a nasty shock for somebody. So we need to make sure that we are, um, are nice and safe. This test is the suggested method for measuring the strength of the insulation um, according to the Higher Association Code of Practice. Now there's very good reason for why we recommend this test. Essentially, this is a repeat of the manufacturer's test uh, as the product comes off the production line. So the, the thought process is that if we can prove the equipment is as safe as it's ever been, then it's safe to go out on hire. And it, as safe as it's ever been, can only be as safe as it was when it's left the production line. So by repeating that production line test, we can be sure that the test is as safe as it ever was. Now, a couple of pointers uh, when you do do this test. Firstly, do not touch the item under test while performing. Keep your hands well away from it. Always ensure where you can that the unit under test is switched into the on position. So if the unit has a physical on off switch, please ensure that's in the on state. Otherwise, we're only really testing up to the point of the switch and we wanna be testing beyond that and into the uh, the entire appliance. So the voltages will vary depending on the equipment's classification. So for class one equipment, uh, we apply a voltage of minimum 1000 volts, and that's applied between the live and neutral pins. So we strap the live and neutral pins together. This is all done automatically within the tester. And then we send a test voltage out through the live and neutral pins. And if there's any current flow, it should flow back down via our earth test uh, our, sorry, our earth cable, and give us a reading. For double insulated products, as we've already mentioned multiple times, we don't have an earth pin. So what we simply do in this case is replace the pin for an external probe. So we take an external probe and we place that onto the exposed conductive parts and we make sure there's no current flow coming back through. This time, however, because the product is double insulated, we effectively apply 
double the voltage. So the voltage jumps from a minimum of 1,000 up to 2,500 volts. So how do we know if the uh, equipment is good or not? Well, ultimately, we know it's good if there's no current flow coming back down through either the earth cable or the, uh, or the probe. But according to the code of practice, and again, according to the manufacturing standard, uh, a good test is where the current flow doesn't exceed 5 milliamps. Now, again, back to our statement about manufacturers. If you do receive readings greater than 5 milliamps, it's worth contacting the manufacturer. If they advise that the reading is, is above 5 milliamps, then, then all being well. But only apply that rule once you've spoken to and had that confirmed with the, uh, the equipment manufacturer. Again, we're just going to pause quickly. We'll show you a very quick uh, animation to explain exactly what's going on during this test. And then we'll move on to the next test. The flash or dielectric strength test is carried out by applying a high voltage, typically 1500 volts AC, to both the live conductors of the appliance. If there is any breakdown in the insulation, the pad will measure the current flowing through the insulation to protective earth. A test probe is required when testing a class 2 appliance. The probe is applied to any exposed metal parts. If there is any breakdown in the insulation, the pad will measure the current returning via the test probe. Now the next three tests we're going to talk about um, are basically deemed as alternatives to the the flash test that we previously spoke about. There are good circumstances when you may need to apply one of these tests uh, as opposed to the flash test. Now we do have a complete um, second webinar that talks all about the alternatives to flash testing, which goes into much more detail than I'm gonna go into today. Um, but know that these three tests can be used as an alternative if it's not possible to perform the flash test. I'll give a couple of examples as we move through this presentation. The first one being that we're going to talk about is the insulation resistance test. So the insulation resistance test, again, is a, is a measure of the adequacy of the insulation between the main supply pins and the earth or the external chassis if it's double insulated. Um, it may be suitable if you have products that have sensitive electronics. It may not be wise to perform a, uh, a high voltage flash test on it. Um, as a good example, that may include things such as battery chargers for any, any kind of battery powered tools you may have. So much like the flash test we spoke about before, the test is applied by strapping the live and neutral together, sending a test voltage up through the live and neutral and measuring any current flow coming back down either through the earth cable or through a probe uh, if it's a double insulated product. In this instance though, however, we only apply 500 volts or alternatively 250 volts um, to, to the device. And rather than measuring and displaying back the current flow, the tester will perform a quick calculation using Ohm's law to give you a resistance in, in mega ohms. Now, the insulation resistance test is, is kind of a strange one in, the, um, in terms of limits because it's the only one that applies what we call a floor limit to the um, so the result, in essence, that the floor is the lowest reading before it fails. With most tests, what we're looking for is a reading beneath the, the pass limit. In the case of the insulation resistance, we're looking for a reading above the pass limits. So what constitutes a good test when we, we perform this test? It depends on the class of equipment. It's nice and easy to remember, however. For a class 1 equipment, the resistance must be greater than 1 meg ohms. And for class two, the resistance must be greater than two megs. So if for any reason the reading is beneath those values, the test would be deemed a fail uh, and we, we, would, we would stop testing at that point. So again, let's return to our animations. We'll give you a quick view of exactly what's going on and come back and talk about some of the powered tests. Insulation testing is carried out by plugging the tested appliance into the pad and applying a test voltage of 500 volts DC to both the live and neutral terminals of the mains plug. If the insulation is in good condition, a high insulation resistance reading is obtained, typically in the order of hundreds of mega ohms. If there is a breakdown in insulation between live parts and protective earth, 
a current will flow across the insulation and back to the pad via the protective earth conductor. The measured insulation resistance is greatly reduced, indicative of an insulation fault. When testing insulation on a Class II appliance, the test probe is connected to any exposed metal parts. If the exposed metal parts are insulated from live parts, a high insulation resistance measurement is obtained. If there is a breakdown in insulation between live parts and any exposed metal parts, a current will flow across the insulation and back to the pad via the test probe. The measured insulation resistance is greatly reduced, indicative of an insulation fault. We're now going to talk about what we call mains powered uh, tests. All of the previous tests are what have been defined as dead tests. In, in essence, the equipment isn't doing anything whilst we're performing the test. It's not powered up. The next two tests we're going to talk about are, are mains powered. So effectively, we're performing the test whilst the unit is in operation. So bear in mind that mains voltage will be applied to the next couple of tests. The reason I bring that up is there is a safety element to that that we'll, we'll cover in a second. But the first test we're going to talk about is what we call our protective earth conductor current. Uh, a lot of you may know it as earth leakage. It, it's the same thing. Um, that's just its, its official name. So a protective earth conductor current can only be performed on a product where there is an earth because we're looking for leakage through the earth cable. Um, so therefore, we only perform this on class one equipment. This test shows the current being lost through leakage. Now that can be done in a number of ways. In the main way we're going to talk about is what we call a differential leakage test. So it talks about the leakage loss through the difference in the currents flowing in the live and neutral conductors. So if you imagine we had an absolutely perfect circuit, we turn the power on, the uh, electrical current flow heads up through the live cable, through the appliance and back down through the neutral. Now in an ideal world, everything that went up through the live would come down through the neutral and therefore we'd have what we call a balanced supply and there'd be no leakage because there's nowhere for it to go. It's flowing up and, and back down through the neutral. Now, if we have a problem, if we have a fault where current flows, that means we have a path that's flowing away from the live conductors. And what that means is we're gonna get an imbalance between our live and neutral cables. So the, the differential method basically tells us what the difference is between the current flowing in the live the current flowing in the neutral, and if it's sufficient enough to cause a problem, the, the tester will uh, will call it a failure. There's another way we can do this, and that's by measuring directly exactly what current is flowing within the earth cable itself. Um, very simple way, we just have a, an ammeter that reads any flow in the, uh, in the earth cable. So what does this mean, and, and how do we determine whether the product is, is, is good or, or unsafe? So, as we've said, we power the equipment up, and the unit is either measuring the difference in the live and neutral or the, uh, the actual current flow in the earth cable. And in order to determine whether it's good or not, we need to understand exactly what type of equipment it is. We spoke about this earlier, whether it's portable, handheld, transportable, etc. And the limits apply to those type of equipment. So you'll see again on, our, uh, on the display at the moment, if it's portable or handheld, we want the reading to be less than 0.75 milliamps. If it is then it's determined good. For other equipment, so the likes of transportable or, or stationary equipment, we're looking for the reading to be less than 3.5 milliamps. Obviously, it's more important that anything that we're in contact with with our hands has a much lower uh, current flow because we're going to be directly in contact with that at all times. For heating equipment, so any of you that have kind of the red rads or anything like that, out on higher, the pass limit is 0.75 milliamps per kilowatt. So we need to know how many kilowatts the, the heating element is, and then we just multiply that kilowatt value by 0.75, and that tells us exactly what our pass value is. If that pass value is greater than five milliamps when you work it out, the uh, the maximum pass limit we need to apply to that is, is five milliamps. So if you do do the calculation and it comes out greater than five milliamps, we still need to apply a, a minimum of, of or a maximum of five milliamps uh, onto that, that pass limit. So as I said, this is a mains test and I did say treat this with some caution because obviously the product will become active. So if you are performing this test, please make sure you remove any kind of cutting or drilling parts. Be aware that if it's 
designed to get hot. It's going to get hot. And therefore, there may be other hazards that come about just by this thing uh, being live. So always take that into account. Uh, but again, let's have a quick look and show you exactly what's going on via the animations. To measure a protective conductor current, the appliance is plugged into the pad. When the appliance is energized, current will flow from the main supply to the appliance in the live conductor, indicated via the brown arrow, and then return to the supply via the neutral conductor. If there is good insulation between live parts and protective earth, the live and neutral currents are equal, i.e. all of the current entering the appliance in the live conductor returns to the supply in the neutral. If there is a fault with the insulation, some of the current flowing in the live conductor will return to the supply via the protective earth. The PAT will detect this imbalance in the live and neutral currents and display the result. Okay, so for the final core electrical safety test, let's talk about touch leakage. Now, touch leakage, much like the protective earth conductor current leakage test we've just spoke about, is applied to equipment whilst it's live. It's generally performed on class two equipment where we don't have an earth. And effectively what it's doing is simulating what would happen if you or I were to touch the equipment. What current flow would potentially flow through our hand that's in contact with the equipment and, uh, and what shock hazard are we likely to, uh, to get from that. So effectively what we do is we take a clip or a probe and we apply that to the metal bond points on the um, or metal exposed metal points on the device and that effectively simulates a human hand that is then taken through a what we call a body model which is effectively a resistor the human body has a resistance of two two kilo ohms roughly so we we take it through a body model and that effectively then gives us a reading back of exactly what what you or i or the average human would would be exposed to should they touch it so the unit's live we place a probe on and um, yeah, and we get a reading back. Now that reading is, is very simple. Um, for all equipment of, of class two, any touch leakage test must have a current flow of less than 0 0.25 milliamps. So in this case, it doesn't matter whether it's handheld or portable, the, the limit is fixed uh, at, at all times. One other safety concern to, to just be aware of during this test, again, as we've said, things are gonna move they're going to power up you should also then take care not only for uh, kind of taking off the the hazardous parts but also be cautious of where you're going to place your clip make sure that clip doesn't come into contact with any moving part that could potentially damage the equipment or fling the clip off at high speed uh, and potentially uh, you know causing a hazard that way so finally let's take a quick look at how this test is performed and then we'll talk about some of the, uh, the functional tests. The touch current test is carried out by connecting the pad to the appliance and the test probe to any exposed metal parts. If there is fault with the insulation, some of the current flowing in the live conductor will return to the supply via the test probe. The pad will measure any touch current returning via the probe and display the result. So once we've performed the main electrical safety tests, it's then possible that we want to perform a functional test just to make sure the equipment is, is working as, as we'd expect. Now this can be also with the inclusion of a measurement. So we can measure the current draw from the equipment to make sure it is, is as we'd expect. And it's worth noting that down to, to ensure that it's consistent every time we, we perform the test. Now these functional tests are generally what we would call no load tests, i.e. we're not gonna be drilling into a piece of concrete or grinding through a piece of metal at the time. We're literally generally just gonna be spinning the product up in, in air. Um, so again, it is a mains test. It will switch on, take into account the hazards that, that may, may come into place with that. So what are we looking for for this, this functional test? Well, first and foremost, it could be as simple as plugging it into the wall, making sure that all the switches are, uh, are performing their job, any electrical safety cutout devices 
doing their job exactly as expected. But as I mentioned, we may also want to measure the, the current and that current can tell us some useful information. For example, if the if we are doing a no load test on it, we shouldn't expect that the product is pulling anywhere near the amount of current that is stated on its, its rating plate. Now, if for example it was, that could be an indication that the motor is having to work harder just to spin up, which could be you know, a problematic gear train, it could be uh, bearings in the device going, going faulty. So it's always good to do this test, certainly as a matter of course, as part of the electrical safety test, when you first get the product, because that will give you a base reading. And then every time you test this product, you can compare it to the base reading to see if it's getting worse. And if that reading is getting worse, you know there's something happening within the device that it's having to work harder. Now, if you were to get a zero current and the operating of the product is not happening, i.e. it's not switching on, it could indicate that there's an open circuit somewhere in the, um, in the device. It could be live or neutral, not, not, not open. So if the switches appear that they're working correctly, then there could be a break in the supply lead. Now, where that could be a problem is that all the previous safety tests will be invalid. If the circuit isn't completed, Therefore, we have no idea that we've actually performed the test correctly. So if you do find at the point of the, the functional test that something's not working, i.e. the product isn't functioning, then we should go back and retest the, uh, the, the whole appliance once you've found the fault and once it's been, uh, been repaired. The final test we're going to talk about today is, is the polarity test. So this polarity test is performed exclusively on extension reels and leads. And the idea is that we're making sure that the connections are made correctly. So live is to live, neutral to neutral, earth to earth, and that there's no cross wiring, uh, no open wires. So it's, it's basically a test on the, on the cable to make sure everything's wired up correctly. If it is, everything's safe, providing the previous tests have all been performed on the equipment. So just to finalize this, what are the minimum required tests that we absolutely have to do uh, in accordance with the code of practice to make sure our equipment's safe? Well, for class one equipment, we should be performing a visual test. We should be performing an earth bond test. We should be performing a measure of the insulation. Now, again, the suggested method via the code of practice is to do the flash or, or the high pot test as it's known, um, but you may have to perform an insulation resistance um, or one of the mains leakage test in its place if it's not appropriate to perform uh, the flash test. And then finally, we would perform the functional test to make sure it's all working. For class two equipment, we simply perform a visual test, an insulation test, and a functional test. Being no earth, there's no requirement to perform uh, an earth bond test. One of the questions we're often asked in regards to testing of equipment in the higher industry is, is mostly around frequency of testing. How often should we be testing? Who owns the responsibility of the testing once it's out on hire? So we thought we'd address that a, a little bit today. Um, the good news is the answer to both questions are contained within the HAE's code of practice. Um, firstly, let's deal with how often should you be testing your equipment? Well, the statement within the code of practice is nice and simple. The recommendation is that once the electrical equipment is returned from hire, it is then subjected to a combined inspection and test prior to the unit being rehired. So in between each testing period or in between each hire period, we should be ensuring that the equipment is tested. And that's for very good reason, because we don't know what state it's coming back in. We need to make sure it's safe uh, before it goes back out. The other question is regards to what about shelf life? We've got a piece of equipment it hasn't gone out the door for three months. Uh, what do we do with it? Well, we would recommend kind of conforming to a risk assessment policy on this. How likely is the equipment to become unsafe just by kind of storage on the shelf? Now, there is a secondary aspect to this. Your customers may require a kind of recent certificate. So as a service, you may want to um, test any equipment that's been on the shelf a little bit longer uh, just before it goes out, just to make sure the, the customer has a, an up-to-date certificate. So what about testing of equipment whilst it's with the customer? Well, again, this is addressed and the simple fact is that the responsibility for the electrical safety of the equipment passes over to the person renting the equipment 
once the uh, the contract has been complete and it's on their site. Now we do recognize this is potentially an extra revenue stream where you may want to charge your customers for retests or for replacement equipment. Uh, but ultimately the responsibility falls on the line of the person taking the equipment on hire and they should comply with the IET's code and practice for in-service inspection of testing during the period that it's on hire. Once it comes back, back into responsibility of yourselves to do the testing and get it away again, back on hire. So we'll quickly talk about test records and labeling. Uh, records should be kept um, both for testing and for uh, any register of repairs that you may perform. The testing records are good for two reasons. Number one, they allow you to ensure your products are tested. You've got that traceability should anyone want to see it. But number two, they also give your test operators the ability to look for any kind of degradation over time. So they can compare the readings over a period of time and see if anything is going wrong that potentially does need to be addressed before it becomes unsafe. Now, it is recommended that all equipment is uh, kept records for the lifetime of its in-service period. So you have those for, for as long as you have the equipment. And those records can be paper or digital, providing you had a, have a good enough method to, uh, to store them. Now, for the equipment itself, it's recommended that as it goes out and higher, there is something attached to it, whether that's a uh, label or a document that clearly shows the equipment status, as in pass or fail, along with the date that the equipment was last tested. Now we just briefly, before we bring the webinar to a close, want to touch on verifying your test equipment at regular periods. Now I'm sure you all have the yearly calibration performed, which tells you your equipment is, is testing and measuring accurately, but what about that interim period? Well, that's where this really useful tool within your workshop environment comes into play. A fault simulator is designed to act like a faulty appliance. We perform the same tests on it that we would on our normal equipment, but in this case, we're looking to see a failure. A failure tells us that the equipment is working correctly. So we'd recommend that every workshop has one of these, and we'd recommend it's done on a daily basis. Simply plug it in, perform the test as normal, look for a failure, which would tell you that everything is good within your, your test equipment. And finally, I'd just like to briefly introduce you to uh, some test equipment designed specifically for the hire industry. See, so would have been making equipment um, specifically designed for hire testing for the last 30 plus years. Um, some of you may remember our old A255 series testers. But currently we have two models available on the market. Uh, we have our SafeCheck 8 series of testers. Now these testers are designed with digital data in mind. So they can be completely pre-programmed with test sequences. They store the results into memory, which can then be downloaded to PC for instant kind of digital backup of, of test results. They can also work with printers to output a pass-fail label or a mini certificate label, should you wish. So they really offer kind of the all-in-one digital solution to, to storing your data and, and performing your testing. For those who prefer a more manual approach to it, we have our uh, our old workhorse, the, the B255. It's been around for a long time. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it. But again, it performs all the required tests that we, we can do for the for the Higher Association Code of Practice, all done via manually, very via a very simple uh, dial and press to test function. Large kind of analog display giving, giving the readings along with um, some pass or fail uh, signals for the uh, the high pot test. So both are perfectly adequate. It just comes down to whether or not you want that digital storage of, of data or whether you prefer the manual approach. Well, that brings us to the end of our presentation today. Uh, I really hope that you all found it useful. I am going to hang around now and, and answer any questions that, that you may have. So please feel free to fire away any questions in the, uh, in the chat or the question and answer uh, function on the Go to meeting uh, tool. Uh, but at this stage, I'd just like to say again, thank you for your time. Uh, and we'll be back with some more webinars shortly.